Summoning America, Chapter 190, Pieces in Place, written by D.R. Doritos, M.D. The situation room was already packed when Lee walked in, the chatter dying down as he made his way to the head of the table. He'd hand-picked this group himself state, defense, intelligence, all the big players. It was just another one of their weekly updates, but he could feel the clock ticking. Not that he was anxious far from it. Landfall at Odahite and the upcoming operations in Ragna got him excited, not anxious. He used to play a lot of grand strategy games. As fun as they were, glassing fanatic purifiers and subverting fallen empires couldn't hold a candle to real geopolitics, especially not in a world as intriguing as Alicia. He settled into his chair, the leather creaking slightly under his weight. All right, folks, let's get started. We've got a lot of ground to cover and not a lot of time to do it. His gaze landed on Ethan Klein, the CIA director. Ethan, why don't you start us off? What's the latest on Wildman's little adventure? Klein cleared his throat before glancing down at his notes. Mr. President, Wildman has been making significant progress in his support of Marcelon Skaldotter and the planned broadcast of Emperor G.R.A. Lux's message. He's been able to establish a rapport with Skaldotter and has laid the groundwork for the operation. Assuming Skaldotter played his part, the operation's success now depended on the performance of their forces. The submarines, they're finally in position? Yes, Mr. President, Hill confirmed. They're in position off the coasts of Ragna and Hofgard, ready to initiate the strike at 7.50 p.m. local time. 7.50 p.m. local time, 10 minutes right before the scheduled broadcast. The thought gave him a sort of deja vu. This is exactly the type of diversion they employed when rescuing the Imperial family. Although, the targets were different this time around. With most of Ragnar's port infrastructure still in shambles from their previous attack, the new targets included the GVE Department of War, air bases on the outskirts of the city, and the Imperial Defense Fleet Headquarters. If that still wasn't enough, Marix would also have to deal with strikes on their naval base at Hofgard. Meanwhile, SEALs would strike at different targets to distract from the real objective, the IBC headquarters. He didn't think Marix would fall for the same trick twice, but was it really falling for a trick, if he couldn't do anything about it to begin with? Good, Lee said, sighing. Didn't think we'd be back for round two so soon. Let me know when Lieutenant Riley's team returns. It's a shame that they haven't had a break, but no one knows the streets of Ragna like they do. I'd like to commend them personally. Of course, Mr. President. We'll keep you updated. So far, so good. Lee turned to Director Klein. And what's your assessment of the potential impact? Should the broadcast be successful? Klein leaned back. If we can get Emperor G.R.A. Lux's message out there, it'd be a major blow to Merrick's credibility, sir. The people believe in the Emperor, in the stability and legitimacy of the Imperial rule. They practically worship him. If they learn the truth about Merrick's actions, that he seized power under false pretenses, he put a finger to his throat and mimicked a slicing action. Well, it'd significantly undermine his position and galvanize opposition to his rule. And there it was, Lee thought, the chink in Merrick's armor. The Chancellor had spun a clever tale, but it was all built on a foundation of lies. Lies about the Emperor's health, about the convenient absence of key figures. Lies that could come crumbling down with a single broadcast. The Emperor's words would certainly mean a lot, but without a full grasp on the internal politics and public sentiment within the GRA Valka's empire, he couldn't yet risk sending the Emperor back home. Marix would undoubtedly fight back, do everything in his power to discredit the Emperor, to paint him as a traitor or a fraud. Then, there was the issue of how exactly to get Cabal in power. Until they could get an accurate assessment of GRA Valkan political stability, he'd have to wait and simply let the message take root. Lee looked up, meeting Klein's gaze head-on. What about the sentiment on the ground? Are we seeing any indications of discontent within the GVE? The Director of National Intelligence, Alan Fitch, didn't beat around the bush. He quickly answered for Klein, Mr. President, our human assets have been providing regular reports from across the GVE-controlled territories, and there's a growing sense of unease and frustration among both military leaders and the general population. In particular, 
citizens are starting to protest and question why they haven't been receiving letters from their family members. It was good news sad, incredibly so, but good in the sense that they were gaining the upper hand in the ideology war. It sucked that it had to come to this, truly. He could imagine how they might feel, knowing their sons, brothers, and fathers are lost forever. Preparation for the Ravernals aside, this fact was all the more reason to end the war as soon as possible. Fitch rifled through his papers, sorting out a few key documents. The war effort is taking a toll, and there are questions being raised about Merrick's leadership and the Empire's ability to sustain the conflict. We've also been able to corroborate this through interviews with captured GV officers, including several high-ranking fleet admirals. Interesting, Lee thought. Admirals Dietrich, Merkinses, and Venstrom. Correct? Fitch didn't need to glance at his notes this time. He knew the information like the back of his hand. Yes, sir. Their statements paint a consistent picture of an empire under strain, with growing doubts about Merrick's strategy and the feasibility of victory. He continued, Venstrom especially was pretty vocal about his doubts. Said Merrick's aggressive strategy isn't sustainable and begged us to show GRA Valken forces mercy. Just like what we did with his fleet. Huh? Lee asked. When did they show mercy to Venstrom's fleet? What do you mean? Our interrogators had the same question, Hill said. The first target we took out was the GVS Adler. He mistook our refusal to take out the rest of the Second Conquest fleet as a sign of mercy, but in all honesty, they were just barely out of range. Good thing he surrendered when he did, though. Ha, uh, Lee simply said. Yeah, good thing. Lee sat back, his gaze drifting to the large screen at the far end of the room, displaying a map of the GRA Valka's empire and the surrounding territories. The pieces were moving, the balance of power shifting, but there was still so much uncertainty, so many variables that could tilt the scales one way or the other. All right, Lee said firmly. Once the broadcast is out and the Emperor's message reaches the people, we need to be ready to capitalize on that momentum. Gordon, Ethan, are all the pieces in place for the next steps? Secretary of State Gordon Hyden gave a confident answer. Absolutely, Mr. President. We've managed to secure contact with a network of key doves still in the GRA Valken mainland thanks to the Emperor's connections. Supplementary media in support of the Emperor's abdication and the Prince's coronation are still in production. We're waiting on more data from the GRA Valken public first see how they react to the Emperor's survival and then make tweaks based on that. We'll let the Seventh Fleet know when the next set of broadcasts are ready. Lee looked at Hill. I thought we were using an EC-130J? Seventh Fleet. Don't tell me you're gonna have them do some sort of jet takeoff? Oh no no, Hill said, shaking his head. It's not feasible. The feasibility studies on extended operational time also turned out poorly. We decided to modify existing MQ-25 Stingrays for the mission. This will happen over the course of their support missions in Mu, using equipment we've flown to Odahite. The Seventh Fleet will continue broadcast operations off the GRA Valken coast after we've neutralized their navy. It was an extremely complicated process and involved significant investment, but it had to be done. If they could get the GRA Valken public to turn on Merricks and pave the way for the Imperial family's return, they might be able to end the war without having to land troops in the GRA Valka's empire. How long will that take? Hill lowered his head as if preparing himself for an unsatisfactory answer. One or two months, Mr. President. Lee held back a grimace. That meant one or two months for Merricks to conduct damage control and undo the impact of the Emperor's announcement. While he didn't expect Merricks to be able to fully sway the public back to his side, having two months meant he had the opportunity to at least set them back. I see. Is there anything we can do in the meantime? Klein spoke up, well, we've got the doves. He looked to Fitch, who continued, We've confirmed that the Doves have access to several radio stations and newspapers. They're prepared to adopt a pro-Lux and pro-Cabal stance, which will give their movement much more credibility. Merricks will be forced to permit their activity or risk a civil war. Klein added, Their operations are currently covert, but they're effective. They're positioned to amplify the impact of the broadcast by continuously reinforcing the Emperor's message. This can help maintain the momentum until we're able to return with subsequent propaganda campaigns. 
It was a stopgap, but it could work. Lee nodded. Do what you can for the doves. Let's hope that the public is as enamored with the Imperial family as you say they are. No worries about that, Mr. President, Klein reassured. With his concerns about the broadcast campaign relatively abetted for now, Lee turned his attention to the next critical item on their list. Their plans for Mu. All right, if that's all on this front, let's take a small break and then reconvene. We need to discuss the naval situation next. After a brief recess, the meeting resumed with a new sense of purpose. Admiral Richmond, the Chief of Naval Operations, took the lead. Mr. President, I'd like to start by providing an update on the processing of POWs from Admiral Venstrom's Second Conquest fleet. Lee nodded, motioning for him to continue. As you can imagine, handling such a large number of prisoners is a significant logistical challenge, Richmond explained. We're working around the clock to process them in accordance with international law and to gather any useful intelligence from the captured officers. And what have we learned so far? Richmond consulted his notes. As expected, most of the captured officers have only provided their basic information, as required by international law. However, our interrogators have picked up on some subtle cues and inconsistencies in their responses that suggest a growing unease within the GRA Valken military. He paused. Of course, we have to be cautious in our interpretation. These are trained officers, and they're not likely to openly express dissent or disloyalty. But when we compare their demeanor and responses to our previous interactions with GRA Valken POWs, there are some notable differences. So, while we can't take their statements at face value, there are indications that the war is taking a toll on their morale and confidence in Merrick's leadership? Precisely, sir, Richmond confirmed. It's not a smoking gun, but it does align with the broader intelligence picture we've been building. Director Fitch's reports of unrest and discontent within the GRA Valken Society seem to be filtering up to the military ranks as well. Excellent work, Admiral. Keep me updated on any additional insights. Lee turned over his shoulder. Director Fitch, I want your team coordinating closely with Admiral Richmond's staff. Let's make sure we're connecting the dots between what we're hearing from these POWs and your on-the-ground reporting. Fitch responded with a quick, Absolutely, sir. Lee nodded and returned his focus to Richmond. Thank you for the update, Admiral. Now let's shift to the Seventh Fleet. I understand they're preparing to make landfall in Odahite. Richmond confirmed, Yes, Mr. President. The Seventh Fleet is currently on schedule to arrive in Odahite within the next 48 hours. We've been in close coordination with the Muin government, and they've agreed to provide us with access to their existing military facilities. He continued, Our advance team has been working with the Muin military to prepare for the Seventh Fleet's arrival. They're ensuring that the facilities are equipped to handle our personnel and equipment, and they're setting up the necessary communication and coordination channels with our EDI partners. Lee nodded, then turned to Secretary Hyden. Gordon, I want the State Department to convey our gratitude to the Muin government. Their partnership and support are invaluable in this effort. I'll personally reach out to their foreign minister, Mr. President. We'll make sure they know how much we appreciate their assistance. Lee turned back to Richmond. Admiral, as soon as the 7th Fleet arrives, I want a full assessment of the base's capabilities and any additional resources you need to maximize our operational efficiency. We need to be ready to hit the ground running. Yes, sir. I'll have a detailed report on your desk within 24 hours of their arrival. Good. Lee made a quick note on his tablet, then looked back up at Richmond. Now, what's the latest on the 5th Fleet and their anticipated engagement with the 3rd Conquest Fleet? Richmond pulled up a map on the large screen, highlighting the projected locations of the two fleets. Our intelligence suggests that the 3rd Conquest fleet is making steady progress towards Michael. Based on their current trajectory and speed, we expect them to enter the engagement zone with the 5th fleet within the next 24 to 36 hours. Lee studied the map intently. The pulsing dots of the fleets on screen made the looming confrontation feel all the more real all the more imminent. Do we have a sense of their capabilities? What are we up against? 
Richmond zoomed in on the third Conquest fleet's icon. Same as all the other Conquest fleets. Nothing we haven't already easily handled. A victory here could be a turning point, Mr. President. If we can take out the third Conquest fleet, it would significantly diminish the GRA Vulcan's ability to project naval power in the region. It would also be a major morale boost for our EDI allies and could potentially accelerate the erosion of support for Merricks within the GRA Vulcan military. Lee could feel the weight of the moment. After removing the third fleet, all that stood between them and complete control over the Articus Ocean was the base in the Conshell Islands. Just as he opened his mouth to ask another question, an urgent message popped up on Richmond's tablet. The admiral's eyes widened as he read the alert. Speak of the devil, he muttered. Mr. President, I've just received an update from the Fifth Fleet. They have engaged the Third Conquest fleet after repeated attempts to communicate with the GRA Vulcans were ignored. The enemy fleet left us no choice but to take defensive action. The battle is now underway.